I think the biggest upside on any investment, but particularly the property with the obviously the ability for it to grow on the leverage position or the growth position is the lower tax environment. While the tax hit might be only 10%, that 10% is higher than the zero, the next property might be a lot more or the next investment might be a lot more. It's constantly reviewing the investment strategy and understanding it and you are directing it. Welcome to Perth Property Insider, where you will learn how to grow your wealth and improve your life using Perth Property. Our show is brought to you by Investors Edge Real Estate, the highly rated and award-winning property management, sales and buyers agency servicing the whole of Perth. Now, here's your host, Jared Mann. G'day, Ash. Thanks for joining me back on the podcast. Really excited to get stuck into self-managed super fun world today with you. Great, mate. I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring this topic with you and covering off as much as we can. Well, almost a week doesn't pass me by where I'm not getting asked, Does what about investing in my super fund using property? And there's a lot of stuff that, you know in the media. There's a lot of brokers that sort of push people into it. A lot of accountants are probably liking the complexity and you know pushing people into it potentially because of fees and other stuff too. So I just wanted to kind of cut through all of that and find out from someone that you know, really does advise people with that larger picture of what's really best for them and what they're trying to achieve. And that's why I grabbed you on the show today. Awesome. Really appreciate it, Jared. And I think I think you're right. There's there's there is a lot of noise in the in the space around um, you know, use your super to get into property and, and all the benefits that come with it. And I think people sometimes forget about all the all the all the risks and costs involved in, in doing this um, as a strategy and and sort of forgetting to talk at things from a big picture. So probably the, the thing that jumps out as first is you the costs are a lot higher than people expect. You know, self-managed super funds are self-managed and is that key word. You're directing it. And you're following the regis- the legislation that's required to have have your portfolio. And that means investing at in a diverse way, managing how how it's operating and following the laws and changes in there. Now you have financial advisors, accountants, and lawyers, and all these other people and property managers and, and buyers advocates that can help you, but that all comes with a cost. And and what we sort of forget is that cost in your super fund relative to your balance is would outweigh the benefits that you might have in investing in property straight off the bat. So the real risk is people with really low balances and going into super without having a clear plan or a pathway or, or seeing a financial advisor to see if it's appropriate. Now, there's nothing stopping people doing it later in life, but you should be, it should be a suitable vehicle for what your aspirations and goals are. And I think a lot of people just don't go in for the right reasons. And mm-hmm. I think it's exploring it. And this money is for your retirement. So, it, it can't be touched. You can't use it till you pull up stumps, as, as so to speak. Though obviously there are other occasions you can access it early, but those are generally very significant events in your life. So do you have too much property if you've got a portfolio outside of it? Is it too much costs involved in it? Are you aware about the financing restrictions that apply? Are you funding it all the way through? And these are topics I think we'll explore throughout, throughout the conversation, Jared, but I think a lot of people just jump in a little bit too quick, and then all the steps to close it and wind it back, adds more cost. So you get whacked on the way in, whacked on the way out. What you really want to do is make sure it's a long-term plan. And if it's a long-term plan, then those costs just basically get amortized over the life of your super. So if it's a 20-year investment portfolio in a self-managed super fund, well, that's that, those costs are upfront at the start and ongoing are averaging a lot lower over time. But if you've got a really low balance, that's a massive cost up front and it's a massive cost if it ends up being closed in the short term. So I think that's where people go awry, so to speak. Well, a lot of people seem to start looking at it because they might have tapped out what they can do personally with their borrowing and they see a little honeypot money in their super and they sort of think, oh, you know, I want more control. I, I'm not getting sometimes the returns that they would want from other assets that they're investing in and what are the other reasons that people come to look at using that good reasons and bad reasons maybe yeah. separate for us. Yeah. 
Look, I think I think that the FOMO or the, the I've had a win, so I want to double it, can be probably. I mean, it's not whether it's good or bad. You, you sort of you're relying on one experience to justify that this future investment plan for yourself. And and from yeah, you know, from what we can gather, diversity of investments is a really important strategy for people over their life. Now, the mix and the match and the ratio all depends on everyone's you know goals and. Um, objectives and yeah that's what financial planners are there to help you sort of come up with that plan but too much in one thing is never usually great for anyone you know it, 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 yeah, in any aspect of our life so financial it definitely applies to the good reasons you see people in there it is for those reasons right they, they want some diversification in property and they, and they maybe want a commercial property or a or a residential property that they see has got really good yield or good return for what they what their objective is, right? So if you're in your retirement phase, maybe yield is a really big thing and it wasn't that long ago, term deposit rates were really low and you had a healthy balance and then you go, look, I want property just for the yield return of 4 or 5% I could get from it. Or if it's a commercial property, maybe it's higher. So all of those reasons are the great reasons to use property. A, it's ticking a diverse, diversification of your asset pool and it's meeting your objectives of either yield or growth or, or combination of both. And if, okay. if it's done with that thought process, I think it, it's self-directed. You know what you're doing. You've apportioned it. You've acted responsible. I don't see any issues with it. Now, there's some added perks occasionally for business owners when they can own their own premise, which then, you know, okay. they still pay rent that they would otherwise pay if they were not the owner of the building, but they like the idea of them paying rent, they know the peace of mind that they own the property so they're there for the long term. They're not worried about it being sold or all those things. So there are some intrinsic values that are monetary that occasionally can be satisfied through the self-managed super fund, but I'll hazard against that should be a driving factor in anyone's decision. Like, yeah, you know, I'm part of the building that owns our property, commercial property that we're in. It, it, there are people that are invested in the property that aren't part of the business. So they've invested for investment returns. So it, it, it is standalone. It's still an investment of the property. And if it ever got to the stage where the rent that needed to be charged was more than what we could afford as our business, well, then it, it needs to either find a new tenant or it has to be sold. And I I understand that risk and opportunity, but I, I go in with both heads, right? There was a peace of mind of, I know that I know the owner, I know part of the owner, so I'm comfortable there, but there's also, it's a return and my super is pretty important for me because that's what's going to fund, hopefully, me and my three boys, my wife, through retirement. So um, I need to make sure it does what it does. Then it can't just be, well, I own the building. That um, love of the building in the initial three months wears off pretty quickly <laughs> yeah. your, your investment return. So I think that's the biggest thing is the emotion of, of the driver is should be, you know, in, well, you know, as a as a person in the industry, we can sort of separate ourselves occasionally, but sometimes people get their hearts caught in it, and it's it's a value. And try and put a, a number next to it so you know how much you're you're putting on it, so you can pair it back later. And I think that's that's good advice for most people to, to weigh up when they go down this journey. Well, in the case of owning your office and having your super own that, you know you've made sure it stacks up both from what you need as a yep. business and as an overall investment. And I know a bit of the inside story on that and how well, you know, you've had a change of zoning there, which is a real massive upside if you hadn't owned that property. And it's really going to form a, a very key part of your overall investments and produce you a fabulous return. So yep. uh, exciting to see what that opportunity has turned into for you. On that, no, it, it was it, well, to be completely honest, I wasn't expecting any of those changes so quickly, but it was more we we stacked. So, I'll run you through what happened. Yeah, take us through. We, we were moving offices, and, and my business by the time was buying our old office, so I had to find a new, new location. So, I was sort of put down that pathway and was like, Okay, I was going to get my funds back from the other property. What are the options we could do in our super fund? And we, we looked at a couple of things. Well, maybe we just pay rent and, and, and go down that path if we can't find a suitable place. So we, we basically went down the realestate.com, our real estate commercial webpage, started circling areas within our 2K radius because it was important for us for traveling. Had to tick some boxes for the business in terms of parking and things like that. So we had to, A, first make sure it could suit the business. 
but then also did it stack up investment wise and we found we found this location where there was parking bays it was close to our old office was within two k's and it was free old land there were some some niggly bits where we engaged a town planner to review the title uh review the MP in easement and what that meant and what were the likely changes that might happen in the in the city uh in the town we were in in terms of gazette changes in the future so all those things were flagged as this is probably a great pick for us now uh, the thing holding us back was you know the current permitted uses of our building which look like that and probably change in the next 12 to 18 months but then all of a sudden it gives us a massive upside so but none of those were guarantees. So we waited in, we got people in, we told them what the rent, what commercial rent was for the space. And we got, so we got a couple of people that are part of the business that own the office, that the investment stacked up for them. So it is, but for us, one of the big parts for us was not to have a loan. And that was the reason we reached out to um, other family friends and, and people we knew for the investment because the loan costs at the current time with the interest severely affected the return and as a result it was the cost so the opportunity costs were too high to go down that path for us in terms of the balance so it, it would have been too much in properties for me and not enough into shares i guess that's another consideration as well with interest rates being a lot higher in this environment and how long will they stay up for you need to think about if there's a cash shortfall on your property how's that going to affect the rest of your super fund that you've got yeah. and and yeah, how does that fit in within the overall plan? Exactly. And I think that the hard the hard part people sort of factor in is right, you might get a self managed super fund loan on your current job because obviously you've got contributions from the job. I mean you've got the rental return and all those things in there. But if interest rates start to rise up, well heaven forbid, you know, touch wood, you lose your job. All of a sudden there's a there's a capacity not to pay and then who knows what the market is and you might be forced to sell if you can't refinance and, and renegotiate that loan so all of a sudden you, you you put yourself in a really risky situation just because you haven't done what what is the gap or what's the capacity you have or the buffer and finance it the- <laughs> yeah and i've seen the i've seen the bad parts i suppose particularly then, hard for some harder for within a self-managed super fund and when the banks dry up they tend to dry up there first yeah, yeah, it, it right. is probably the least, and and that and that uh, maybe some people don't quite understand why why the banks don't lend as much to self managed super funds as they probably did, it. and it all comes back. Typically, seventy percent, isn't it? Yeah, seventy. You can sometimes get eighty with some some lenders, but it's a higher interest rate. Mm. But the, the key part is, from a legislation point of view, the only security that lender has is on that property itself. So. You might have another three hundred thousand dollars in shares, but that doesn't help, or it does help maybe service, but it doesn't help them from a security point of view. So that's why they increase the interest rates, and you can't use the equity for one property for the deposit on the next property. If that's part of your strategy, and sometimes people don't know all of those things at the start, and then maybe they've only got one property in the super fund, which might be fine, and that might be part of their strategy. But yeah, the leverage part makes makes it harder for certain things so but it's also the most powerful thing about self-managed super funds is you might only have half a million dollars in your super but all of a sudden you bought a million dollar property so you've got the upside that that could grow but you've also got the costs that come with it so everyone sort of understands that leverage piece i would assume if they listen to your podcast jared so that that's that's but i that, guess in the that context sense. of that super fund again you're weighing up shares and other assets that you can't get the leverage on and even a 50 or 70 percent loan leveraging on a property is still relatively high and we do need to consider that because it's for the long term and for the you don't really want to jeopardize or put this money at risk in the same way i would think that you would if you're pushing things with your business if you've got a business and you're pushing things with your investing you know, like you don't really want to be pushing things with your self-managed super fund. The way I think yeah. about it, anyway. <laughs> no, and I would say you don't push unless you need to, and that's where that you know that the knowing what your goals or your objectives are is really important. If you, if you know that, it's okay to take the the push because you know you need it for the. And it might be for a certain period of time. You know, you do the hard yards 
to begin with, yeah. you, you go to the you go hard all for that yeah. upside. <laughs> Look, there's there's no right or wrong, but I think as long as you, if you start off with that conversation, if it doesn't work out, you can you take the hit and the, you take the loss that occurs and you, you readjust to what your new objectives and goals have to be because you tried to do it. And all for people going in and having a having a go, having a crack, but do it do it with an informed objective and peace of mind of why you did it because. The last thing you want to do is, like you sort of alluded to, is taking more risk than you needed to. Like that would be not great outcome if it doesn't work out, and all of a sudden you you actually had an easy way out, and you've, you've taken too many risks. Now, which you know we all need to do that check in, and I do it with my wife on our portfolio at least once a year, where we go over it, the whole strategy uh, to make sure it still lines up with our our goals and objectives um, because. Our risk appetite's a difference between me and Jody, uh, which I don't think is any secret to anyone that knows both of us, but it, it, it's part of the winding up. So is there any other, we've touched on a few different risks in there and a few different challenges. Is there any other things that flag up for you for listeners to consider when looking at investing through a self-managed super fund in property? There's probably a couple of times where people probably invested in, in vehicles that they probably weren't allowed to under uh, under under legislation. We've had to do yeah. rectifications or, or, or contraventions with the auditors around it. The best advice is if you're not sure there's something you're going to do, reach out to your advisors around us. That you know that that's our role or our purpose is to try and guide you. We'll, we'll put you in touch with whoever needs to review it to make sure it's compliant. Because um, the last thing you want to do is deal with um, non-compliant funds. So it's a big risk and a big you know, tax whack for people that don't, don't follow the rules. I guess you don't want to go making offers on a property if you don't have your ducks in a row and it's even more so important when you're buying in this sort of entity too. You know, I see it yeah. from the sales agents and the buyer's right. agent perspective just all the time. I'm sort of like, you know, have you checked into all this? Have you actually looked at you? Do you really have your finance all together? Like, is this all properly set up? You know, you can't yeah. just retrospectively go and do so no. number of these things once it's too late. No, the, too late. <laughs> and the, the, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, look, the amount of times we we people have filled out an offer and acceptance incorrectly, and they forget how important that document is. So we, you know, it was quite a few years ago where we we just started. If a client's making an offer on a property, just is a lawyer, and they they know exactly the wording. They've set up your bare trust. If there was financing, they've set everything up so it exists. And it's executed before you fill out the offer and acceptance. Like the steps are really important, and people have missed those steps, and it's been an issue. Yeah, you know, that it would they touch wood. We haven't had any of them for a long time, mm. but people hopefully follow those steps, and you'd be the first ones to see see that usually. And it's yes, it's great that you, you point people in the direction of have you have you done this properly, um, and hopefully they then go back to their accountant or financial advisor or lawyer and, and complete the form in the right right way exactly so we've been fairly negative to start the podcast there Ash. <laughs> um, but you know we did weave that through some of the opportunities that you've had personally with that with your self-managed super fund and you know the upside that you've experienced through you know good asset selection that suited the overall plan that you were trying to execute on and both suited what you were looking for with your business as well as what you were trying to achieve from the self-managed super funds outcomes. Yeah. What sort of other opportunities and key advantages might there be as we, you know, move through in time? Because yeah. obviously we're trying to get to a place where we've got choices and we're able to choose when and how we retire ultimately. So what might be the benefit of having this property in this environment of the self-managed super fund? Well, I think the biggest upside on any investment, but particularly the property with the obviously the ability for it to grow on the on the leverage position or the um, growth position is is the lower tax environment. So you know, tax and super is fifteen percent on earnings and ten percent on capital gains for more than a year, and it's zero percent in retirement if you're under the cap, um, and that cap is indexed each year, which which most people you know. Or we won't pass 1.7 at the moment and indexed higher um, in their retirement mode per member. So 
the substantial savings. Very substantial savings. It, it's, a lot it's of that's people the forget about the taxes of everything, don't they? Like, <laughs> you know, oh, I've made a, you know, I've made a hundred grand profit, two hundred grand, five hundred grand. But how much have you made when the tax man's taken his slice? Exactly. Yeah, so, the, ta- the tax hit is substantial, and, that, and that's 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 why I think when you're investing in property, the thing you're looking at is that long. Long term outlook, and you, you, you might have realized the potential in one property, you cash it out, you might go back into property or another investment vehicle or a mixture of both. But it's it's keeping an eye on them and then knowing that transition point because while the tax hit might be only 10%, that 10% oh, it's higher than the zero, the upside on the next property might be a lot more, or the next investment might be a lot more. So it's constantly reviewing the investment strategy and understanding it, and you are directing it and i think that's the most powerful part with the tax of being lower it doesn't cost as much to change over if you have made a mistake or if the uh, we all look back at our investments and and sometimes we think you know gee i've learned a lot since when i first started and that means you're coming further along as an investor so it's kind of yes you've still got transaction costs to pay of sales agents and repurchasing you know costs of stamp duty and stuff but at least you're not going to get as much tax taken out of the middle at nowhere near exactly. as in many cases. Yeah. Yeah. Tax. Tell that I'm encouraging trading. Yeah. Obviously, you want to buy for the long term and try and have that compounding work for you um, yes. as much as possible. But all, all assets do at some point realize they're peaking. They turn from a growth to a yield, and the yield might not be as much as what you're hoping for an opportunity cost, mm. right? So all investments go through that, whether it's real estate, whether it's shares, you know, growth share eventually becomes dividend paying share and then it doesn't well, have Just, the just touch on that. Explain that to me a bit because I spend my days thinking about and looking at projections and what are we getting out of a property, but just explain that, break that down for me because I don't think I've actually really ever properly explained it on the podcast before. And because you're an yeah. accountant as well, you're just naturally... You're just like, yeah, this is simple. Everyone should understand this. <laughs> oh, apologies if I did go too quick. I probably did. But yeah, like, like assets in this year might be invested for the growth purpose, right? So you're hoping that the share price or the, or the property price goes up, but the, the rental return or the dividend, depending on the asset, the yield is is usually uh, higher when the price is lower because you know the ratio is those are the two things you're comparing. Mm. So you might have a $2.00. Uh, or two thousand dollars in return for a hundred thousand dollar property, where well, you're getting two percent. So, but now if that property is two hundred thousand dollars and you're still getting that, you're only getting three thousand dollars in rent, you're getting you're getting one and a half percent. Mm. So you're actually going down in yield, but the price is up. Now the question is, do you, does the price continue to go up, and the yield just stays very slow growing from that? It lags yield. it and doesn't grow right. as fast as the growth on the property. So the growth in the rental price typically might be four percent, five percent. Growth yeah. of the property, you're kind of hoping for six percent or seven percent, hopefully, but the gap becomes wider, gap doesn't bigger. it? And and the thing you sort of forget is there's there's other investments, right? There's the shares, there's cash, there's there's other things you could be doing with that money that could mimic mimic what the property is doing or what you're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's that recalibration, that rebalance. Is really especially important. if you've had your your growth phase where you've chunked up your money, you've grown your capital base through your different investments. And then when you're entering your retirement or choices phase, you want to be decreasing your debt to almost minimal. And, you know, at that point, we're, we're really then just looking at the yield without leverage and the growth without leverage. So some of those other assets that we can't get leverage on all of a sudden become more attractive to potentially have our money in. I, exactly. We haven't lost people. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I think what you described is, is sort of that stage in life, right? It, it, as you get older, we, we want to adjust the risk because we don't have the yes. ability to come back from the up and downs of a growth mindset or growth investment portfolio. But as we get older, because of that loss of time from retirement, we, we need to de-risk if we can, right? So if you can... Achieve your financial goals and objectives with less risk. You should be doing that, which is what you, what I believe you sort of said was, you know, de-risk the leverage. So don't mm-hmm. borrow as much, move into the yield returns, and and reduce that. And you know that that's a great mindset to have, but it's part of the part of the thing with the self-managed super fund is that re-engagement with that strategy. 
you know, we've got plenty of, and I'd say a decent chunk of self-managed super funds where the financial advisors are still involved. Advisors are still part of that process. You've just chosen to be the, the lead person picking the decisions as a self-managed fund um, or in charge of it, that you can still use advisors to get that balancing right. So at different stages of your life might be at dis- different risk points. Well, that's helpful, I think. And how might people actually go through creating a strategy? Really, it's a case of finding these right other advisors and I guess reaching out to you, you can help them sort of connect them with yeah. other people. And your sort of main role, explain a bit about that for us as well. Yeah, so I, I suppose um, when we get clients coming in for self-managed super funds, our first sort of uh, point is usually just to engage a financial advisor. So just see if the strategy is there yeah. and a, a peace of mind. So it's usually a, it's a consultation that doesn't cost any money for the initial appointment, just so you, they can get an understanding of what you're trying to do. And then from there, they provide a... Um, a pathway forward on, on the next plan and then pricing to go with it from there. So it's it's sort of we navigate around that. We, we work closely with the other advisors. We generally will deal with the compliance. We occasionally will set them up under the financial advisor's engagement and then we will go through the process of setting up various entities and then helping with the compliance, you know, the tax and then preparing the work to be then sent to an independent auditor uh, to review the return every year and then we sort of make people understand the process from that side of it so then they go oh there's there is actually a lot of stuff yeah, that they're responsible um, yeah yeah and and then they've got, at least they've met with in my mind they've met with professional advisors to understand what's in front of them so it, we are very less lo- less likely to be prone to someone wanting to close the fund down in a couple of years because it wasn't the right thing so and i'll it's so much work to close the fund down. No one likes doing it. No one's won from it. You know, we're, we're, yes, people are getting paid, but no one wants to close the fund down in two years. You know, I want clients for 20 years, 30 years. We want, you know, we want people to be in the right structures that suit them. So it's really important that that we go down that pathway. And it's usually a good sign when people can't afford to engage the advisors to set up the fund properly um, or to go through it. It's, a, it's probably a good sign that they don't have the cost to keep up with the ongoing costs of the super fund, which is like, likely going to potentially lead to closing the fund down early, which is what no one wants. And, you know, there's plenty of great resources out there that out on, you know, what could or should be the minimum amount in super, but it's usually quite a significant amount. And some of the worst cases I've seen, some people start self-managed super it's really low like balances and it. It's uh, the balance sort of, I guess, does case by case, does depend on your strategy, does depend on getting your specific advice from your advisors, but what's the ball, kind of ballparks Yeah, just for someone who's listening to be like, okay, well, maybe something we've been to look at or probably, you know, I'm too far off. It's definitely case by case, but I would say the rougher number, I'll, I would say is at least 300 to 400,000 is, is a good amount to have diversification in the fund and not one single not asset. Put it all into property, yeah. Because one, one asset, if it doesn't work, all of a sudden work, it's a lot of pain. And and yeah. that's a big the big issue. But, you know, people are in charge of their own money. Like we said, it's self-managed, it's self-directed. If you choose to go down it, you could go down that path. And I wish it were the best for people that do that, but I just, I, I personally couldn't be comfortable with that little amount of money for me with a pool of money with family uh, in a family fund for it not to work out because we picked one asset and it didn't come come off. So now, again, if you have he- healthy amount of contributions coming through each year, maybe it can be a low balance because you're getting such a high paying income from two people. So there's a lot of contributions in there. So obviously it is, it is subject to change for each person. That's why it is case by case. But what my number would be around that, around that number. So yeah. yeah. And I guess when we start looking ahead and we've got that longer term vision what do you see sort of happening to the landscape because there is a bit of that nervousness about you know is the government going to go changing what we can do in our super it's an ever evolving thing like they obviously want to keep it attractive and encourage people to create that money for tomorrow for them to retire and it is still very attractive with all the the tax rates and other stuff like i still think super has to be a part of your overall plan like what assets it's in you know that's for you to work out but 
any opinion you want to throw on this or any? Yeah, no, I'm happy to. I thought you kind of bait me with the stage three uh, walk back on the tax cuts, but <laughs> <laughs> not in today's episode. <laughs> but the, the government uh, does have the right and the ability to change their minds and change the rates of what we've got in front of us, and it's likely going to happen ongoingly because it changes almost every couple of years. Uh, you know, the, the reason things in super have obviously been that the cap on um, the tax-free amount um, so you're going to pay extra tax if you're in over that balance and indexed um, but then there's the three mil thing they introduced recently if you want the three mil in super per person or per, as a person you, you're going to pay extra tax on your earnings so th- there will be changes but I, I'm of the same mindset of you Jared like it has to be attractive they want people to be self-funded so they're not relying on the public pension so it would always be more attractive for super to be a vehicle um, because it comes with that string that you can't touch it. So if you can't touch it, what's the benefit? Lower tax. Mm-hmm. And I think that will always be there. What will always be the changing part is how much of it will be tax-free. But, well, to be honest, the tax-free amount is a very generous benefit to have in retirement. And there's so many strategies that even you can, the passing to not beneficiary, non-dependent beneficiaries can be achieved through different strategies, through a re-contribution in retirement, into tax-free pensions. So that's another strategy altogether. There's there's all sorts of ways to reduce the tax and super. And, and look, a lot of those things are likely to change in the future. And I, I can imagine it's because the government needs to spend money on things and the way to get that is through taxes. The population with all this extra money, and that's like, well, how do we cover our COVID surpluses and other things we've made money we've been thrown out over the last you know five years look yeah government spending could be another conversation altogether <laughs> but yeah to fund the spending they need the taxes and the taxes come from us so whether it's increasing in the income tax rates or decreasing those it's going to be an uplift somewhere else they have to they have to maintain the tax base strong uh, unless there's more people in the country uh, that's that's what's going to happen and i, I believe it will still be a lot. There will be a lot of attraction. Well, there will be a lot of attraction as to being a self managed fund or a super fund in general, because obviously the same rules apply. Because they want us to be self funded retirement, and I think that will always be a driving factor. So, and longer this- term, when we start to actually think about transitioning and retiring, I I, I always uh, have a lump in my throat when I go to use the word retiring because you know it means different things to different people and you know the whole concept around it is certainly changing now but how does that lumpy sort of property fit within that transition or what can be done and not done because yeah obviously with shares you know you need a bit of bit of uh extra it's if if the dividend's not giving you enough to live off you can sell part of your shares and it's not a big deal you know you've got lots of shares you don't have to sell the whole lot just to get something out so yeah, how does this yeah. kind of fit in this is where property start to get disposed of it and conversations should be happening years prior so one of the things that happens is as you actually get older um the minimum amount of pension you have to take out increases so the whole the whole benefit of the tax-free part of the super is it's tax-free but you have to take the minimum pension that's allocated to your balance so if you've got Two million in there. All of a sudden, at certain parts of your life, you might have to take eight or nine percent out of your fund. Now, your if your property is returning that, great. You're not having to take take uh, the sale, but you know, chances are the property's not returning. Most that. likely, it's going to be less than that by the time you get to that stage, as we've covered earlier. Yes, and 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 all it takes is a revaluation, and you're out of whack. So you, you need to, and you don't want to be forced to sell the property. So it's always worthwhile when you're getting close to that retirement stage, um, or in those early years of retirement, to start analysing the yield returns, and you might have to start to dispose of assets. So you, I, I always like a five year window or a three year window, ideally three to five, and go well. This asset does need to be disposed of in the next three to five years. We're going to monitor that market. So we'll, we'll reach out to you know real estate agents or the share market, or whatever the asset is, and realize realize it at, at a point that we're comfortable with. And then you feel like if it hits that price, right? We we've done what we needed to do for our fund. It lines up with our objective to invest elsewhere and provide that yield. So, and that's that's me probably wearing a few hats as a as a self managed super fund that also happened to 
you know, be formally a financial advisor. I know how to do those things. But if it's not in your wheelhouse, then reach out to the advisors to help you put that plan in place so you, you know, okay, I'm getting close to retirement. What am I going to do with this property? Mm. Usually, you know, if they if it's managed well and it's not causing any issues, they, they're happy to hold on to it for another three to five years. They just might want to sell it. So they'll reach out to a, an agent like yourself and go, look, Jared, if this reaches this sort of price point, can you let us know? Because that's when we want to probably dispose of it. Yeah. And, you know, then everyone's had the conversation and, and, and there's a plan in place for, for that asset. Awesome. Well, that makes a lot more sense now that we've kind of tied that back in with the beginning. And where does someone actually get started? Is there educational tools or is there any sort of misconceptions that get in the way when someone starts heading into this? And hopefully we've cleared a few up with this episode. But Yeah, look, there's there's probably a, a few resources. Probably the Money Smart website actually has a great resource on it. So that's that provided by the government. From all disclosure point of view, I'm part of a, another website called SMSF Mate where we go through a whole bunch of self-managed super fund topics and, and cover off on those. But there's other resources out there. But I'd say whenever you listen to anything, it, it is is always question it and, and seek it professional advice. And you know, I love people listening to your your show, but you'd hate people just to listen and, and act straight away. It's it's to engage people and have that conversation. We're trying to impart what knowledge we can from a general point of view. But reach out. My contact details would would be in yeah, touch. Sure you know, SMSF mate's yeah. great. But there's there's heaps of resources in this space. But reach out. Ask people questions and if they're willing to give you answers it's a good good start um, and you feel like you're with an advisor so that must be my advice out there well thanks for coming on today and chatting through all of that if you've no. made us to this point listeners uh <laughs> yeah you get a bonus well, what, yes. what is it jack <laughs> but um no i really appreciate your time and your insights and uh i'll catch you on another future episode as soon as i get another craving for some more accounting slash uh, <laughs> I would need some sleep at night. And I just, I just like, <laughs> Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Just a reminder, the information discussed in this podcast is general in nature. As we don't know your specific situation, you should always seek professional advice before taking any action. For free market reports on your suburb of interest and other helpful resources to grow your wealth, make sure you join my property investor update at investorshedge.com.au slash join. And finally, make sure you're a member of our Perth Property Investment Facebook group to be part of the conversation with other like-minded investors, get help to your questions, and get a feel for what's going on out there in the market. I'll see you in the group.